Welcome everyone, my name's Sylph, and this is my attempt to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Heart Gold with only Fighting-type Pokemon. If you've watched my videos or hardcore Nuzlocke's before, I'm sure you're familiar with how they work, but if not, you can pause the screen for the rules to see how this all goes down. Alright, it's time to tackle a hardcore Nuzlocke of the greatest remakes of all time, Heart Gold and Soul Silver. This time with a type that has never been done before in these games, and there's good reason for this. On the face of it, there are a good amount of viable encounters that we could get in this run, however, there are some of the most interesting encounter methods of all time in this run. Part of the reason why no one's done this before, and some of which you might not even know about. With that said, I think I've found a way to make it work and attempt a completely legitimate run with them, so let's buckle in, it's gonna be a fun one. Before we get into it, we have a birthday to celebrate. Today's video is sponsored by our good friends at Raid Shadow Legends, which is turning 3 years old this month. As one of the top free-to-play RPG games out there for mobile and PC, one would think that those at Raid might just sit back and enjoy the success, but no. This is one of the things I love about it, they never stop adding new and fresh content and game modes. If you enjoy my content, that likely means you enjoy collecting and battling RPGs with challenging elements just like I do. And as a high-level collection RPG, Raid's got hundreds of unique characters you can play with called champions, and tons of wicked bosses too. Remember that new content I mentioned? Well, Raid's recently added a new faction called the Shadowkin, a tribe of fierce warriors from the east who were liberated from the reign of evil. And there's nothing like having new challenges to face too, such as one of the biggest and baddest clan bosses out there, the Hydra, which has multiple heads, each with a different ability and each requiring different strategies to destroy. This month, with the three-year anniversary going on, it's gonna be huge. Free gifts, new content and events, tournaments with wicked rewards, new champions, new artifact sets, and fully personalized videos showcasing every player's raid journey and their own personal achievements. You can use my custom link down below or scan the QR code on screen to get started. New players will get a free starter pack worth almost $40 to kickstart your game. We're talking free champions, Misericord, Tiger Soul, and Romero, and 10 Magic, 10 Force, and 10 Spirit XP Brew. All new and existing players can get a bunch of free birthday gifts worth over $25. Once you're in-game, enter promo code 3 years Raid to get your hands on everything. Simple as that. Thanks to Raid for supporting the channel, and let's get into the run. Ah, nothing like good old New Bark Town. So peaceful and such nice people, too. Like this girl, who compliments my bag of all things. Thanks. It's Gucci, baby. Gucci. <laughs> I've never owned Gucci anything. It's time to pick our starter, and I know what you're thinking. So, where are you gonna get a fighting type? Well, this is the only small edit that we're gonna make. We're gonna put the first fighting Pokemon we can get as a viable encounter, Machop, and make it a starter Pokemon in place of Cyndaquil. Machop is normally available in Goldenrod City if you trade an NPC a Drowsy, and technically we could catch a Drowsy as an HM Pokemon and trade it, so we're just gonna get this encounter a little bit early to make the run possible. The Machop, that is, not the Drowsy. I name him Liddell, and Liddell ends up having a lonely nature, which means it gets plus attack and minus defense. Not bad at all. He also has the Guts ability, which increases his attack power if he has a status condition like Burn, for instance. Amazing stuff. I, all right, stop that, Liddell. It's weird. Let's go show our mom that we got a brand new po- Ugh. Sylph, what the hell is that? I thought you were getting a cute starter Pokemon. Mom. It's time to visit Professor Oak and Mr. Poke- Oh god, guys, every time! Wait, y you guys produced an egg? What the f***? After pounding this red-haired dude into the ground with Liddell, we get back to the lab where... Great. Five minutes into our journey and I'm already being accused of a federal crime. Because of this, I tell the officer that his name was Gray. He doesn't deserve to be silver. Take that. Also, I use the American spelling because, well, that's where most of you guys are from, and I'll get 200 comments telling me it's with an A, not an E. That's right, I'm a sellout. Once Lyra's done goofing off with her Meryl, she gives us some Pokeballs, officially starting our run. In no time, we arrive in Violet City, the location of the first gym. Beforehand, we have to take on the Sprout Tower, though, which I'm not complaining about since all the trainers have, you guessed it, Bell Sprout, which give attack EVs, and Liddell learned Karate Chop along the way for 50 power and a high critical hit ratio. 
Now one thing that's great about playing Heart Gold is that we get the exclusive Bellsprout as a wild encounter too for more attack EVs, however, there's a trade-off, as we can only get Caterpie, not Weedle. This poses a big problem, but there's one solution. We can battle Bugcatcher Wade here who has a Weedle, and I basically just stalled out by using Focus Energy to wait until he poisoned us. This is going to be crucial for our gym battle, as now our Guts ability has been activated. Just as importantly, I make sure to register his number as he can find and give the player berries too. Now, I had actually tweeted out to see if anybody knew whether or not he could call you before the first gym, and eventually our mom called us to give us some Colber berries since we had her save our money. It took an hour and 46 minutes, but eventually Wade did indeed call as well and we got some Oran berries. Now, why all this crazy preparation you might ask? Well, the first gym is terrifying, a flying type gym. With as much preparation as possible and making sure to potion before battling him to get rid of poison damage from walking, it's time for the first gym leader, Faulkner. He leads with a level 9 Pidgey, which I'm hoping we outspeed thanks to our speed EVs from Rattata, and we do, and with Guts, we're able to one-hit KO it with Karate Chop. One good thing we have going here is that the Pidgey line also has the normal typing, so fighting moves are neutral and not resisted. In comes the big threat though, Pidgeotto. Now, I had made sure to level up to high level 13 before the battle so we could hit 14 by the time this thing came out, which is allowed in hardcore Nuzlocks. He outspeeds and hits us with super effective gust to below half, but our Orenberry brings us above half before Karate Chop then brings him below half. But unfortunately, no crit. I'm hoping this plan works as he goes for Gust again, and we survive on just 9 HP before we can smash him with another Karate Chop for the win. Incredible. Guts and the Orenberry were 100% necessary there if we didn't want to have to rely on a crit, and I can't believe we pulled that off. First badge acquired. After picking up the Rock Smash HM from this gem of a man, I also opt to buy some netballs for a particular reason that we'll get to in a bit. Now, in the Ruins of Alf, we can actually do something very cool. Smash these rocks in order to get shards, which we can then return to this man in Violet City to trade them for a whole bunch of cool berries, including citrus berries, which are amazing to have early game. On our way to Azalea, we run into this guy who offers us a $1 million slowpoke tail, and when we politely decline, he says, And I thought kids these days were loaded. Where in the world did you hear that? We are dying out here. We have to rely on freebies just to get by. Speaking of which, in the Pokemon Center, here comes our savior, this man, who gives us an old rod which unlocks our next encounter. If we go back to Route 30, we can fish for none other than a Poliwag, which will eventually evolve into a fighting type. We catch it in a lure ball and name her Rhonda, and Rhonda has a docile nature which is neutral. I'll take it. Since it's not a fighting type, we won't use it in battle yet, but it's still an exciting thing nonetheless. Moving forward, we can pick up the Shell Bell, a great item for this early on, and we can also tackle Union Cave. Now, since we only have one viable Pokemon at this point, I avoid all the trainers so we don't pass the level cap. Good thing I checked the basement here too, as we can grab the Rock Tomb TM, which might be crucial for us. Up ahead is the Slowpoke Well, and not only does Kurt tell us that he broke his back, but a Rocket Grunt up ahead says he fell down the well as well. What is with everybody breaking their back around here? Mike, what do you have to say about this? A, a, a vertebrae or, or well, what portion? Spinal. Now, after taking on Proton up ahead, I realized this is not good. We've already reached the level cap, and that's while purposefully avoiding as many trainers as we can. So, upon getting to the Azalea Gym, I have a bit of a plan. Our rules state that we can't use non-fighting Pokemon in battle, but to make this run possible, I decide to send out Poliwag without using any moves on her, and then just switch into Liddell to attack so that they split the XP. If anything, this makes things harder for us. Much harder. As we almost lost to a Beedrill using Fury Attack, but because of the focus energy I had used, we got a crit Karate Chop at just the right moment. Whew. Now even that has brought us nearly to level 18, but there's a solution. The only required battle from here on is a double battle so we can deposit Poliwag and they won't challenge us if we have only one Pokemon. Man oh man, this has been crazy so far. With that, it's time for the second gym leader, Bugsy the Bug-type trainer. He leads with a terrifying threat, a level 17 Scyther which is part flying type. Thankfully he has no actual flying moves, and I taught Liddell the Rock Tomb TM which is 4 times super effective on him. However, he goes for focus energy and I'm like, uh oh, as Rock Tomb then hits him hard, but doesn't KO in the red. Yikes. It does lower his speed though before his berry activates, and we would outspeed, but he has priority quick attack, and gets a crit down to just 10 HP before we land a second for the KO. Wow. 
It's not over yet though. In comes Metapod next, and with Rock Tomb's low accuracy, we nearly died to it, but our Shell Bell saved us as it gives us recovery every time we make a move. We then struggle hard against his Kakuna, and I was actually hoping it might poison us with its repeated poison stings, but it kept not happening until we were brought to just 7 HP. Then the damage from the poison happened, and we were left on literally 1 HP before I went for Guts Boosted Karate Chop for the accuracy, and it worked. Unbelievable. One singular HP saved the entire run. Let's go. It's not over yet though, as Silver challenges us to battle, and we are already at the next gym's level cap, so you know what we have to do. He leads with a Ghastly, and I have to lead with Rhonda for the switch, and he went for Curse. One Rock Tomb does the job from there though, as he just used Mean Look. In the end, the switching actually kind of helped us here, as we could get rid of the Curse, and his Croconaw kept using Scary Face, and we got a crit on one of our Karate Chops, so we only got hit by one Water Gun. His final Pokemon is Zubat, and after re-switching Liddell back in, he didn't go for Supersonic since he already had Rhonda confused, but he went for Bite, and then surprisingly we outsped with Rock Tomb for the one-hit KO. Nice. After rescuing the Farfetch'd in the Ilex Forest, we get rewarded with the Cut HM, and we can also go back to their house to pick up the Charcoal item to boost Fire Moves, and that might be useful later. The key to our next encounter comes in the form of this man slamming his head against a tree repeatedly, as he can teach our Pokemon Headbutt. Bringing it back to Azalea for our next encounter, we can use Headbutt on trees to find a tree where there are both Apom and Spiro between level 3 and 5 only, as this way we can find an exceptionally rare Pokemon, Heracross. I tried Netballs, which are supposed to work well on bug Pokemon, and they didn't work, and then my Great Balls didn't work, but our first regular Pokeball did. Seems legit. We catch it and nickname her Holly, and Holly has a gentle, plus special defense and minus defense nature. Not terrible. I trained her up against Bellsprout a ton for attack EVs, and she learned Aerial Ace of all things at level 13, which is pretty cool. After Lyra's grandma makes things terribly awkward between us, we arrive to our next destination, Goldenrod City. Before anything, I hit up the department store to go to the drawing corner, and after spending like 20k on it, we finally get the number one prize, the Flash Cannon TM, something that we might get a lot of use for way later in the game. Speaking of the late game, we also grab the Pokegear Radio, which oddly enough could unlock some encounters for us. Sounds weird, I know. It's time for the Goldenrod Gym, a normal type gym, and yes, on the face of it, it seems like an easy task, but we all know what kind of hell awaits us. At level 19, Heracross learned 75 power Brick Break though, which should be an incredible power up. With that, the third gym leader is upon us, the infamous Whitney. Oh boy, here we go. She leads with a Clefairy, and I lead with Holly. Brick Break is an outspeed and instant one-hit KO on that thing. That feels really good after what that thing's done to us in the past with Metronome. In comes the big threat though, Miltank. She outspeeds us unfortunately and hits us with Stomp and gets the flinch. Ugh. She hits us again to below half before our berry and then we hit her with Brick Break, but we only bring her down to a quarter. Another Stomp then hits us to 15 HP and we flinch again. No way! I cannot stay in now as we're within KO range, so I have to switch into Liddell. We get hit with Stomp, and thankfully it doesn't do over half. We just have to not flinch, but she goes for Attract. Alright, we just have to not get Attracted this turn then, and we don't and can slam her with Karate Chop from there for the KO and our third badge. Well, once Whitney stops crying that is. Now, in the game corner, there is a lot of good stuff we could grab, but not a whole lot we can use right now, and if I'm honest, I can't stand the game corner grind anymore, so we'll pursue this later. Up north on Route 35, we can grab the Payback TM, a 50 power dark move which doubles in power if used after the opponent, so that should be amazing for a slow Pokemon like Liddell. The Pokeathlon is our next destination, where we engage in a standoff with the owner's Poliwrath. What is wrong with that thing? Ooh, Rhonda is pissed at that glare. Let the heat flow through you. <laughs> now the problem here is that the one item we would want to get is only available on Wednesdays, and yes, that's the singular way to get a water stone before the post game. Craziness. We'll come back tomorrow for it. In the National Park, we can hop the fence to grab both the Dig TM and the Soothe Bell too, a couple of great items. After squirting all of- Alright, let me rephrase that. After utilizing the Squirt Bottle Key item on Pseudowoodo, we... 
All right, never mind that as well. Don't ask what's going on here. We arrive in Ecritique City where the next gym is. Once Cringe Master Deluxe over here is done with his routine in the dance studio, this kind gentleman gives us the Surf HM, which is going to come in handy very soon. The Burn Tower brings about a few legendary Pokemon and a few legendary human losers too. The man who thought he was destined to get Suicune, the man who thought he was destined to get Ho-Oh, and the man who thought he was destined to become the greatest trainer of all time. Let's see about that last one. Gray's Ghastly confuses us immediately, but we make it through for the payback one-hit KO. His Zubat then comes in and hits us with Wing Attack to just above half, but we break through confusion to slam it with a Rock Tomb. Since we lowered his speed, we can then just outspeed on the next turn to take him down. That works. Croconaw then smashes us with Ice Fang to 20 HP, but we can then use Revenge for huge damage. We have to switch now though, so Holly is a perfect answer, being able to KO him with Brick Break after he just used Scary Face twice. His final Pokemon is a new Magnemite, which of course has its life ended by a giant horned beetle after missing Supersonic. A pretty lucky battle on our side, but I think we had it either way. Now the Ecruti Gym is a tough one. Not only can we not use our same type attack bonus or stab moves against the ghosts, but the gym leader is also quite tricky. Thankfully, Liddell could at least blow through the trainers with payback, but not without taking some damage. Liddell is definitely great with payback, but the gym leader's Pokemon will likely overwhelm the little bulk that he has. Just before heading to the gym leader though, I remembered something. We can go slightly east of Ecruteek to Route 42 to find none other than the Shadow Claw TM, which might just be our answer. The fourth gym leader is Morty, a ghost type specialist, and he leads with a ghastly as I send out Holly. Thankfully, we're able to outspeed it and slam it for the one hit KO immediately. In comes one of his haunters next, and we also outspeed it and also destroy it with super effective Shadow Claw. Alrighty then. In comes his biggest threat though, Gengar, which immediately outspeeds us and hits us hard with Shadow Ball, and then we return with a Shadow Claw, but it just barely doesn't KO before his berry. He then uses Hypnosis, the bane of everyone's existence when facing Morty, but I had prepared for this with a Chesto Berry that we got from that department store drawing center, so we instantly wake up and smash it for the KO. His final Pokemon is another Haunter, but Holly still outspeeds it to win our fourth badge. That strat worked out pretty well, I'd say. Now that the Poke Gods will allow us to use Surf, I teach it to Rhonda, who can now take us across to the other side of Route 42, where we can access the grass. And this is crucial because it actually brings about our next encounter, a Pokemon that is exclusive to Heart Gold, and the very reason that we're playing it, Mankey. We catch it successfully and nickname him Mir, and Mir ends up having a jolly nature. Unreal. Plus speed and minus special attack. It's not often we get a perfect nature, but it's all the more exciting when it does happen, and I can't wait to use a Primeape of all things. Quite an underrated Pokemon, I feel. Before anything, I go way ahead to the Lake of Rage to grab an incredible item, the choice specs to boost special moves at the cost of only being able to use one move, of course. Up ahead, we run into this girl who, after the battle, says, Boys give me items after battles, but sometimes they give me too much. I can share some if you want. Let me get your number. Wait a minute. Is this second-hand gold digging? I'm down. We're then ambushed by that's how you pronounce his name, right? Who tells us about his plans for the Safari Zone, and that's going to be important later on. Now at the Moo Moo Farm, we reach the damn mill tank who apparently wants orange berries, but won't eat them when I offer them. What the hell, man? I've been trying this out ever since I was a kid, and I've either had this problem, or I never have enough of them to give. Take them, you complete f You're gonna die! After resolving that matter and shoving 400 berries in its mouth, we get rewarded with the Pokeball Seal Case. Ah, so that's what you get. Decades-long trauma resolved. We also get the Drain Punch TM near the other mill tank, so I guess that's worth it. In the lighthouse, Jasmine refused to open the gate when I came up here by the elevator, causing me to have to nearly die by climbing up like eight stories. Then we arrive in Cianwood City to pick up some medicine for Amphi. But that thing can suffer a bit more while we take on the gym, right? During the long grind, we have a couple of team power-ups as Mir evolves into a Primeape, a wickedly fun Pokemon, and our starter Liddell also evolves at level 28 into a beastly Machoke. Before anything, it occurred to me to take on the Red Gyarados with Liddell using Rock Tomb, which was quite a close battle, as this way we can grab the Red Scale from it to give to Mr. Pokemon who gives us the XP share in return. That way we can finally start getting some levels on Ronda. After some more grinding, we have another evolution as Rhonda evolves into a Poliwhirl, and I put the game down for the night. 
Picking up the next day, it's now Wednesday, meaning the Waterstone is available at the Pokeathlon. We just have to bust our ass Pokeathloning it up to get enough points. Don't get me wrong, I love the Pokeathlon, but not in the midst of our adventure. It's time to finally make Rhonda into a viable Pokemon, as we can use the Waterstone to evolve it into a Poliwrath, a Pokemon I very rarely get to use, so this is awesome. I decide to make it a special attacker since it's the only one we'll get and I attach the choice specs on it. What a chunky Pokemon this is. Uh, can you can you stop eating the ground, please? It's time for the Cianwood City Gym, a fellow fighting type gym, and Rhonda handled the gym trainers quite well with choice specs boosted Surf, and we also had Heracross with Aerial Ace who did a good job. However, at one point, I had no idea this dude's Hitmonchan had Fire Punch of all things, so uh, yeah, that was a close one. The fifth gym leader is Chuck, and I'm a bit worried about him also having a Polyrath, but let's see what we can pull off here. He leads with a Primeape, god what a copycat, and I decide to lead with Holly here. I know he has double teams, so having Aerial Ace is amazing as not only is it super effective, but it cannot miss, so it doesn't matter how much he increases his evasion. He ended up going for Leer though after we hit him low, then after he Hyper Potioned we could hit him twice more for the KO. In comes his ace, Polyrath, with our defense low. We outspeed and land an Aerial Ace for less than half, and then he hits us with Surf for a quarter. Realizing with lowered defense a body slam could very well KO us, I switch into Rhonda, and he went for Surf, so our Water Absorb cancels it out. From here, we essentially trade body slams, but his berry activated and he paralyzed us on his very first attack. Good thing is, he tries to go for Focus Punch a couple times, which we can cancel out, and we got a crit at one point before he potions, so in the end we're able to tip the balance in our favor, being left with below half for our fifth badge. Pretty solid. I had a Chesto Berry on Holly too in case he hit us with Hypnosis, so I think we were pretty well prepared. After being given the Fly HM by Chuck's wife, we get to witness Lance kill a man with his Dragonite's Hyper Beam, and in the Mahogany Town Rocket Hideout we can grab the Thief TM so we can get some tight boosting items in a little bit. Liddell was an absolute monster running through the trainers, including Executive Petrol, and in the end we're challenged by Ariana in a double battle with Lance on our side. Lance is gonna hate us, but I essentially spam Surf to hit both opposing Pokemon with Choice Specs, and as I planned we only hit Dragonite a couple times as he kept using Fly. Murkrow was quite tough to handle with his power powerful wing attack, but thankfully Rock Tomb on Liddell saved the day yet again. Hitting up a nearby Mart netted us a whole bunch of amazing items from her mom as she sent a Silk Scarf, Choice Scarf, and Muscle Band. Always have her save your money for this reason. Now because Price's levels are lower than Jasmine's, I decided to take on the Mahogany Gym first and I tested out Mirror against the trainers who turns out to be quite a force to be reckoned with, even outspeeding things like Jinx and one hit KOing with Assurance combined with the extra power from the Muscle Band. The next gym leader is Price, the Ice type trainer, and with our fighting typing, I'm feeling pretty good about this one, although his team is bulky. I ended up teaching Rhonda the Focus Blast TM that we got from the department store to help us out. He leads with a seal, and I send out Rhonda, who resists both water and ice. We miss our first attack, what's new, and he uses hail. Great. We then miss our next one, and he hits us with icy wind to drop our speed too. Oof. I kid you not, we then miss another one before finally landing one which KOs thanks to the hail damage on it since it's only a water type before it evolves. In comes Dugong next and we have one last focus blast and we hit it after being hit with an Aurora Beam and we got a crit although I think we might have KO'd anyway. In comes his final Pokemon, Piloswine, and because of the choice specs and no more power points, I have to switch into Holly as he just reset the hail. I then can switch back into Rhonda to tank Resisted Blizzard to 45 HP, but then we get frozen. Are you kidding me? If we had our Focus Blast, we could have just swept his entire team, but now what? We then don't thaw out, so I'm forced to switch as we end up with just 12 HP after hail, so I go into Holly and he hit us with Ice Fang as we're left with just above half. We hit our Brick Break, and as I thought, it just barely doesn't KO before his berry. Then he lands a Blizzard, but we survive on just 24 HP before landing another for the KO and the win. Alright, that was way, way messier than it needed to be, but we got through Deathless. Wait, did he just say that his luck has run out? Did you not witness that battle? With our 6th badge in hand, we can now use the Pokewalker to grab a new encounter from the Rally Course, a Krogunk, which I nicknamed Masvidal. Masvidal ends up having a Lonely Nature, plus attack and minus defense, not bad. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite evolve before the next level cap, but I think we'll be okay. After saving Amphi and getting the call from <laughs> that the Safari Zone's open, 
Oh, and getting trolled by Jasmine's gym trainers who approach you as if they're gonna battle you but then don't. We can face off against her, the seventh gym leader and a steel type trainer. I lead with Mir against her Magnemite as I know we can outspeed them and avoid getting paralyzed that way and Karate Chop takes down two of them instantly. In comes her Steelix next and this is an easy switch into Ronda who avoids Iron Tail and destroys it with a super effective stab choice specs boosted 95 power surf. There was never any hope, my dear. After waiting until level 38 so he could learn Poison Jab, we can evolve Masvidal into a Toxicroak, a Pokemon I've been wanting to use for a while ever since we got Drapion instead in the Great Marsh back during a Gen 4 run. A trip back to Goldenrod has us done a rocket uniform, perfect for a Toxicroak I feel, but like, why you look like that bro? I thought it would be really cool to roam around the region in a rocket uniform, but they block the city exits and you can't fly out at this point. Damn. Fine. No terrorizing Johto citizens, I guess. At the top of the radio tower, we face Petrol, who now has a series of exploding coughings and wheezings, which has doomed us in the past. It was at this point I wished we had the damp ability on Polyrath to prevent them from doing so. Regardless, Ronda does a great job smashing a few with Surf, but his wheezing lowered our accuracy and poisoned us, so eventually we got brought down to just 11 HP before switching into Holly. And in like 8 moves, they never poisoned us when it would have been good for us with Guts, but we pulled through regardless. What an annoying dude. I made sure to level up substantially since we have the chance, and were challenged by so I mean, Grey in the underground, and I did something kind of funny. I attached the Choice Scarf on Liddell so we could outspeed his Golbat with Rock Tomb, which allowed us to KO in two hits. His now fully evolved for Alligator was then able to be countered by Ronda now that we can use her, although we missed two Focus Blasts again, so we got brought to just a quarter as he broke through Confusion too. From there I send out Mir, who got paralyzed by Magnemite, but I had a Cherry Berry on him which healed it, and then he could sweep through Magnemite with Karate Chop, Haunter with Assurance, and Sneasel with Karate Chop too. That speed and power is amazing. Alright Machoke, it's time for you to assert your dominance against your peers. Oh wait, no, 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 not like that! Our final battle against Ariana is upon us, and it was made difficult by Arbok, who resists like everything that we have, and has Intimidate, but I went with Holly to try and get a Shadow Claw crit, which didn't happen, but I was kinda hoping for the Paralysis too to activate Guts, which she did do, so we could KO while taking little damage. Murkrow could destroy us in one hit, so I switched into Ronda, who tanked it well and could one hit KO it with Surf, and then I switched back into Holly, could handle her Vileplume with Guts boosted Aerial Ace through Paralysis, although it did take two hits. The final rocket battle is against Executive Archer and, well, Choice Specs Polyrath with Surf absolutely devastated all three of his Pokemon and especially his fire types. Our team is like perfectly suited to killing the Houndoom line in every possible way, isn't it? A long trek through the ice path nets us the Never Melt Ice item, which I have plans for, and in no time we arrive in Blackthorn City where the final gym is. Beforehand, I head to the Route 45 side of the Dark Cave so we can finally pick up the black glasses from this very suspicious individual. Forget that I saw you. Sheesh, what is this guy up to in here? Maybe I don't want to know. I also finally committed to the game corner grind so we could get the Ice Beam TM, which I taught to Rhonda. With that, it's time for the Blackthorn City Gym, a dragon type gym, and we had kind of a perfect setup here for the trainers as I could send out Rhonda for the Never Melt Ice boosted Ice Beam KOs on all the dragon types, and then switch into Masvidal for the water types like Seedra since he's also immune to them with the dry skin ability, then Revenge was a two hit KO at most. The eighth gym leader is Claire, a dragon master, and if I'm honest, I'm kind of scared for her, but I think Ronda might be our answer. She leads with a Gyarados though with Intimidate, and I realized we have no straightforward answer to this thing, so I send in Masvidal. The best thing she can use on us that I know of is Dragon Rage, which does a set 40 HP damage, so I just go for Poison Jab with the Shell Bell, hoping we can kind of outdo it over time, and our third Poison Jab does the job even through Intimidate with us below half. Nice. In comes Dragonair next, and I don't want Ronda paralyzed, so I switch into Liddell to take it, which activates Guts at least. However, we stayed paralyzed for four turns in a row after our Citrus Berry 2, so we couldn't get a single hit off when we likely could have one hit KO'd. Are you kidding me? Here, I switch into Mirror though, since I know she won't Thunder Wave again, and we tank a Dragon Pulse before Cross Chop instantly one hit KO's. Wow. In comes the big threat though, Kingdra, so I immediately switch in Ronda, and the Hydro Pump gets cancelled out. We should be able to do massive damage with Focus Blast, but she hits a Dragon Pulse first, and gets a crit, and it KOs Ronda immediately due to its sniper ability which increases the power of crits. Why? That is the only way we could have lost a Pokemon, and it happened on the first attack. Unbelievable. 
Here I switch in Holly, who I pre-poisoned for guts, and she used smokescreen to lower our accuracy before Brick Brick does over half before her berry. She then outspeeds with a hydro pump, but we tank it reasonably well and don't miss Brick Brick, thankfully, but she survives on like 1 HP. Ow! It's looking like this might all be over, so here I just switch in Masvidal knowing she'd heal. However, she starts going for a Hydro Pump, which actually heals us due to our ability, and eventually all she can get off is one Hyper Beam to take us below half before Masvidal saves the day. Holy. She still has a Dragonair left though, and our whole team is damaged badly, but we can hit it with Poison Jab low, but get paralyzed. She then full restores, then hits us with Fire Blast, but we survive on 27 HP and land an attack, but she survives again and got poisoned, but her shed skin ability immediately healed it. Of course. I could go for Sucker Punch here for priority, but if we stay paralyzed, we lose Masvidal, so I switch into Mir, who tanks Fire Blast reasonably well actually, and then we can outspeed to KO for the win and our final badge. What an insane battle. I have no words except I am devastated by the loss of Ronda. So unnecessary and a Pokemon I was heavily relying on for the league. With 8 badges in hand, I felt it was finally alright to do our trade evolution to get a beastly Machamp, a Pokemon I'm super excited to use. In Ecruteek, we face a massive challenge, the Kimono Girls, who you have to battle consecutively without healing or reordering Pokemon. So I sent out Mir first, who handled Umbreon in 2 attacks, the second through Confusion, survived a Psychic from Espeon on just 4 HP before KOing with Assurance, man that was close, and from there I could bait the quick attack from Flareon while switching into Liddell, who actually got burned and smashed it with revenge, then I tried switching Masvidal in against Jolteon, which wasn't a good idea, but thankfully Holly tanked a Thunderbolt with above half, otherwise our entire run might have been over. Then Liddell could take down Vaporeon with a guts boosted revenge after beating Quick Attack on Mir again. Phew, close one. The Tin Tower is our next destination, and apparently ho -Oh has been waiting for someone like me for many years. And waiting for me for what? To kill it? Oops, I- okay, sorry ladies, I- bye. Now we have a very interesting situation here. We can finally use Waterfall using Rhonda's dead body. And after a long trip, we arrive to a trainer way deep in the cave who is apparently from the Saffron City Dojo of all places. After defeating him, he gives you a gift Pokemon, a Tyrogue, which is the only way you can get one or anything from its evolutionary line in this entire game. I name it Rashad, and Rashad has a hearty neutral nature. With that, Victory Road is upon us, and deep inside we can grab the Earthquake TM, which might be vital. After giving a few iron vitamins to Tyrogue to ensure its defense was higher than its attack, it successfully evolves into a Hitmonchan. At level 31, he learns the elemental punches, which I think will be crucial, including fire, ice, and thunder punch, and also has the iron fist ability to boost their power. After fully maxing out our EVs and grinding close to the league's level cap, Silver was quite a manageable battle, although we did have a close call with Rashad at one point, but he definitely helped with type coverage. Once we've completed final preparations, like gathering any items and TMs we need, we arrive at the Indigo Plateau Pokemon League. Before entering, I made sure to go to the Burn Tower to fight Magmar so we could pre-burn Heracross and Machamp on their Flame Body abilities to activate Guts. With that, it's time for the first Elite Four member, Will, the Psychic-type trainer. Yep, what a thing to start off against. An Expert Belt on Rashad would be amazing, but we can't get one yet, so he's not an option. However, I have an alternative plan. I taught Masvidal the Swords Dance TM from the game corner, so I use it once before Zatu uses a 4 times super effective Psychic, but I attached a Pyapa Berry which weakens the power of it, so from there I can use Priority Sucker Punch to sweep through his entire team after a Swords Dance. I knew that since we're at low health we'd bait attacking moves, not status ones, and it sure worked. Incredible. Probably the only strat that we had, to be honest. The next Elite Four member is Koga, the Poison Specialist, and I was feeling very worried about his Crobat and Muck in particular, but after a bunch of theory crafting, I think I have a plan. He leads with an Area Dose, so I lead with Rashad for the one hit KO with Muscle Band Boosted Fire Punch. In comes his Crobat next, so I stay in as he slams us below half with Wing Attack, then Ice Punch barely doesn't KO, and his Berry heals him. I'm forced to switch, so I go into Mir who tanks a wing attack on a quarter, and then I was really hoping that my speed calcs were correct, and they were, so we could KO him with return. Venomoth then came in and was handled by a switch into Holly as Psychic did nearly half before Guts boosted Aerial Ace KO'd. Fortress could then be handled by a switch into Rashad since I knew he could only KO with Explosion, and 4 times super effective Fire Punch smashed him into Oblivion after a Swift. 
His final Pokemon is Muck, and this thing is powerful and has Minimize, so I switch into Liddell. He hit us below half with a Gunk Shot before our berry, then we could outspeed with the Guts Boosted Earthquake I taught using the TM for the KO and the win. The next Elite Four member is Bruno, a fellow fighting type trainer, and well, his team was able to be handled by a Guts Activated Holly with Aerial Ace taking down all three of his Hitmons, close combat destroying Onyx, and close combat smashing even Machamp for the KO. Holly? Chill, y you're scaring me. The last Elite Four member is Karen, the Dark type trainer, and although we're super effective against her, she's still got some threats like Murkrow. She leaves with an Umbreon, so I send out Mirror, and amazingly, despite its high defense, Cross Chop obliterates it immediately. In comes Murkrow, so I went for Return to bring it into the red, then Pluck does over half before she heals, so two more can take her down. Gengar comes out next, and we can't one-hit KO this thing and won't outspeed it, so I have to switch. I decide to go into Masvidal, and she ended up going for a Focus Blast, which doesn't do much. Now, Destiny Bond is what I was worried about, however, I realized if we just use Swords Dance, we can tank one hit, and then just go for Sucker Punch, so the only time we'll attack is if she actually attacks, thereby avoiding Destiny Bond and getting the KO. Her final Pokemon is Houndoom, and I only have negative priority revenge for super effectiveness, and we can not switch at all, so I'm gonna have to hope for the KO with Poison Jab. The speed tier is incredibly close though, but we do outspeed and get the KO. Let's go. Her final Pokemon is Vileplume, which is handled by Holly's Aerial Ace with ease. It's time, the final challenge, the champion of Kanto and Johto, Lance the Dragon Master. Let's be real, he's essentially a flying type trainer, so I'm terrified. A ton of theory crafting, and I have no idea how this will be pulled off, but let's try it. He leads with an Intimidate Gyarados of all things, great, so I send in Rashad, who's able to save us with 4 times super effective Thunder Punch, but we barely don't KO on a sliver before getting hit to half by Waterfall, but then after he heals we can take him out in two more. In comes a massive threat, Charizard next, so I switch into Liddell, who tanks Air Slash on just 41 HP before our berry. I thought he'd take it better than that. Hoping for a fire move this time, I switch into Mirror, and he actually misses Air Slash. Alright, I'll take it. Return then doesn't even do half as he slams us with Air Slash and an immediate one-hit KO. Uh-oh. With the free pivot at least, I can now send in Rashad, who gets the outspeed and KO with Thunder Punch, thankfully. But, Aerodactyl comes in next and outspeeds our entire team. I switch into Liddell, and Aerial Ace takes him down instantly. Rest in peace, sweet prince. I needed that pivot though, as now I can send in Masvidal, who tanks Aerial Ace on 17 HP and responds with Revenge, but it doesn't KO on a sliver. But, no matter, as we can now use Priority Sucker Punch to take him down. In comes his level 50 Dragonite though, and there's nothing more that can be done. I hit him with Poison Jab, then he smashes us to death with Outrage. However, it's time. Rashad, the Punching Prince, has 4 times super effective Iron Fist boosted Ice Punch, and I know is able to outspeed every single one of his Dragonites, as three mighty dragons take the fall to the boxing legend himself. We've done it. We've defeated Champion Lance, but there's little time for celebration, as the journey is not over yet. The biggest challenge is yet to come. And we have just two surviving Pokemon from Johto at this point. After getting the SS ticket from Professor Elm, we can head to Olivine City where Oak is there to meet us and he upgrades our Pokedex to the National Mode. Now interestingly enough, this is actually going to open up some brand new encounters for us. First, we can head to the Safari Zone where now that the full scope of Pokemon is opened up, we can head to the Meadow Area with Peak and Forest Blocks which allow us to get new Pokemon, including our next encounter, a Riolu. Amazing. We catch it successfully and nickname him Griffin, and Griffin ends up having a docile neutral nature. Now, as our Safari Zone encounter, this is going to cut off Breloom, but I think a future Lucario will be a bit more useful. Now, with the National Dex, we can also get a new feature on the Pokegear. If we go to the Music Channel, on Wednesdays, something called the Hoenn Sound will be playing, which hoards new Pokemon in areas that they weren't available previously. Although, they are quite rare. By going to the Slowpoke Well, we can now search for and eventually find a Makuhita, which we catch and nickname Pen. Pen has a careful nature, plus special defense and minus special attack, which is pretty good. Now on Thursdays, the Sinnoh sound plays on the channel, and by heading to the Sprout Tower we can eventually find another encounter, a Metatite, which strangely enough is the only non-Sinnoh Pokemon to be found with the Sinnoh sound playing. Weird. 
We catch it and nickname him Shogun, and he has an adamant plus attack and minus special attack nature with the pure power ability. Flawless. After a ton of grinding, Pen evolves into a beastly looking Hariyama, and we also have Shogun evolve into a very powerful Medicham. Not only that, but with some love and friendship, Griffin also evolves into a Lucario. Some incredible team additions that just might save us. In Blackthorn, we can visit the Move Tutor again and get some great moves for them too, including things like Aura Sphere on Lucario. It's time to take the boat to the Kanto region, and I don't know how in the world Pen fit in there to be honest. Arriving in Vermilion City, and we have a whole new adventure ahead of us. As we've talked about before, since we can have fully EV trained teams with great items at this point, the Kanto Gym Leaders are overall fairly easy, and with Lieutenant Surge for instance, I could purposefully activate our Guts ability with Pen, and also use Lucario's Aura Sphere, which can't miss, to avoid getting stuck on his double team gimmick. The only major challenge was the Psychic Leader Sabrina, who I theory crafted on forever and was not finding a way. Her Espeon even has skill swaps, so although Metacham's not weak to Psychic, losing pure power would make it useless. It took me an embarrassingly long time to figure out that the answer was making it through Espeon with Guts Fake Out on Pen, and putting a Choice Scarf on Holly and going wild with outspeeding and Shadow Claw, even outspeeding Alakazam. Oh, and Brock was a complete mow down with Lucario with Choice Specs and Aura Sphere. No contest at all. Misty would have been a threat by the way, but her Starmie doesn't have a single psychic move for some reason, so we managed through that pretty well. After acquiring all eight badges, the final test is upon us, the Perilous Mount Silver. After picking up one of the best items in the game, the Expert Belt, it's time. At the peak stands the most powerful trainer in the two regions, the former champion, Red. Without any words, it's time to do battle. He leads with his trusty level 88 Pikachu, so I lead with Pen, who I pre-burned. I go for Fake Out for the flinch, which does over half, then on the next turn he smashes us with Voltackle for massive damage to the red, but the recoil takes him down and our berry heals us a bit. In comes Charizard next, and there's no use switching and having someone get hurt, so down goes Big Boy Pen to a Flare Blitz. No mercy, huh? Here I switch in Rashad with the Expert Belt, who outspeeds, but Thunder Punch just barely doesn't KO, and then he hits us with Air Slash, but thankfully we survive, and he goes down to Hail as we're left in the red. In comes Lapras next, and I go for Stab, Super Effective, Iron Fist, and Expert Belt boosted 85 Power Sky Uppercut for a smashing KO. In comes Blastoise next, and Thunder Punch just barely doesn't KO, but paralyzes, but he makes it through for the Blizzard KO. Rest in peace, Rashad. From here though, it's time to unleash the beast. I send out Shogun with pure power, and Red heals a few times, but ultimately succumbs to a few Thunder Punches. In comes Snorlax next, a defensive beast, but Shogun's high jump kick connects and takes him down in one hit. Unreal. His final Pokemon is Venusaur, and super effective, Stab, pure power, Zen Headbutt, earned from the Battle Frontier of all things, devastates it for the win. We've done it. We beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Heart Gold with only fighting types, and what an adventure it was. Incredibly tough at times, but a super cool collection of Pokemon, and one of the most fun runs that we've done in my opinion. I hope you also had fun with the run, and if you did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button as it really does help a lot and grows our community. A huge thanks to my YouTube members and patrons who make these videos possible. If you'd like to support and get your name up here, the links are also down below. If you enjoyed, drop a like down below to help the video out, and leave a comment letting me know what kind of run we should do next, and I'll see you guys for our next challenge video.